Good morning, uh, my name is Patrick Allen, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project uh, the, for the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And the program in, in Cincinnati is uh, conducted by uh, Brian Powers, and uh, he is located at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. And I usually forget to uh, introduce my cameraman, who today is Jim O'Donnell, who is also a, a veteran uh, and, and Navy person. Uh, we have the pleasure today of uh, interviewing Donald Edward Muncy. Do you go by Donald or Don? Don. Don. Yeah. Don. Thank you for doing this interview. Oh, I'm pleased and, to do it. Okay, uh, yeah. right. And uh, this will be as painless as possible. So uh, tell us, uh, before we get into your military activities, why don't you talk to us about uh, where you were born and when? Well, I was born uh, up above the grocery store apartment in Huntington, West Virginia, in uh, October the 27th, uh, 1922. And what were your mother and father's names? Uh, my father's name was uh, Carmi Muncy, and my mother's name was Imogene, but she went by Jean, Jean Muncy. So your dad's name was Carney, C-A-R-N-I? C-A-R-M-I-E, Carmi. Carmi, Carmi okay. yeah, Carmi. Uh, and your mother was, uh, her, her nickname was Jean? Jean. What was her maiden name, do you remember? Imogene. Imogene. Uh, last name was Hendershot. Hendershot? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hendershot Lane, yeah. The, where, where was your dad from? Where was he born? He was born in Appalachia in uh, Wayne, West Virginia, back in the hills. Okay. Uh, was he from a mining family? <laughs> no, his father was a tobacco and corn farmer uh, just outside of, of uh, Wayne, West Virginia. And how about his mother? Uh, did she work outside the home? No, she... she she said uh, she was just a mother. She had seven children, so she was busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so did your dad uh, work all the time, or did he have time to go to school? With no, my, fortunately, I think he, I don't know the specifics, but he only went to the sixth grade. He didn't have a, much of an education, right. but he helped his father on the farm, I guess. So. Okay. Um, so uh, your dad was uh, one of seven? Yes, he had a brother and five sisters. Uh, uh, he was at a disadvantage there, and <laughs> five sisters. Five sisters, Dad. What, and what? he was the, uh, he was the <coughs> youngest. I think he was the youngest of the, of the clan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did any of the kids uh, finish high school or go on to college that you know of? Not that I know. Not, I doubt it. I don't think so. Not that I know of. Well, you were born above a store. Yeah, Spurlock's grocery store on the corner of, I forget the name of the streets, but uh, there was a small grocery store there, and they had an apartment above it. Okay, and uh, is, uh, is that where you spent your early years? No, we only lived there, I don't know how long, but we moved to, uh, he was transferred, he worked for the Columbia Gas gas company okay. and uh, we were we moved to a small uh, town about 15 miles Barbersville above Huntington and he worked there for a while and we moved to Burlington uh, to uh, uh, that town and we lived there just uh, several years as far as I remember but anyway I was five years old when we finally decided to move to Springfield Ohio from uh, okay from so did your dad get transferred up here? To yeah, he was, he was transferred up here, yes. And he still worked for Columbia Gas Company. Well, my wife was born in West Virginia, and I've been in Huntington and Barbersville. I'm sorry? So my wife's from West Virginia. Oh, really? And I know Huntington and Barbersville oh, great, uh, great. fairly, fairly I, well. I don't know either one too well now. But it's been a long time. So how many in the family moved here to Springfield? We were the only, uh, we were the only ones. They all, uh, they all lived around uh, Huntington, parts of Huntington and Kentucky in that general area. Okay. Uh, when your mom and dad and you moved here, how many, did you have brothers and sisters? I had a younger sister. She was uh, two, year, <clears throat> see, two, two years younger than me. 
Did she, and, she move with you? Uh, yes, <clears throat> yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, did you go to grade school here in Springfield? Yeah, I went to sixth grade school. It seemed like we, we moved about every, <laughs> every six months or so, but I started in the old uh, northern schools on the north side of Springfield, northern, and Chris no longer there. It's been torn down a long time, but I started the school there, and then I went, we moved, let's just say, different parts. I think my mother was always wanting to move closer to some school so I'd have so far to walk. So I went to about five different schools. But, but all those schools were within the Springfield area? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> what, uh, what grade school did you uh, finish eighth grade? The eighth grade? Eighth grade. Well, I was uh, junior high school. It was uh, 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 seven, eight, and nine. That's all when right. they had the junior high school at Snyder Park, which is just down about a mile and a half from here. It's still a viable school? Well, it's been it's been changed and, and I, I think probably modified, but it's now an elementary, strictly an elementary school. All right. And where, where did you go in high school then? Springfield High School, and that's on, uh, on uh, South Limestone Street, yeah. <clears throat> and did you finish high school? Oh yeah, I graduated in 1940, June of 1940. Right. Did you work at all during high school? Well, yeah, you know, uh, when I was in the ninth grade, the, uh, in junior high school, Springfield High School started a vocational class. And uh, it was either uh, uh, pattern making, uh, machinist, or uh, drafting. And my uh, homeroom teacher, which was a good friend, he was also my Sunday school teacher, he, uh, uh, of course we were, I was a product of the, of the uh, depression. Depression, right. And I didn't have, we didn't have the funds to go to school, nor had I earned the, the proper credits with a vocational class to, to go to college. I didn't have, I probably couldn't have got an entrance requirement, but anyway, I, I, uh, I went, I elected to go to the machine shop class. So 10, 11, and 12 uh, classes were all in the machine shop. I spent four hours a day in the machine shop and the rest of it on, you know, math and that sort of, that well, sort of thing. So. You mentioned the Depression, so let's talk a little bit about life for your family during the Depression. Uh, what was it like? Well, like I say, my parents were hardworking, very intelligent people, uh, and, and, uh, and my father had, uh, they laid off a lot of people for the gas company since he was new here, and uh, he converted an old car we had went back in and, and sold ice. He used to get ice and, and in fact I went on the roots with him several times and he sold ice. He was the ice man. And he was the ice man and my mother uh, made candy and sold it on the weekends. Of course she, she insisted that I get some kind of an education. I liked music so I studied violin for about seven years and she paid I think pretty much for my lessons by selling it on the weekends. But, uh, she made uh, candy starting on Fridays and, and, and peddle it downtown on Saturdays. Okay. So, uh, but we had, we had our, our difficulties with uh, depression. I, in fact, I went to the YWMCA and there was a, a club called McGilvery. He used, I think he eventually became mayor of uh, Springfield, uh, McGilvery, and they had a club called the Club McGilvery Club for Underprivileged Kids. I got in that. Okay. That's where I learned to play ping pong and learned to swim and that sort of thing. But so that was a recreation center, was it? Yes, it was on uh, on Fountain Avenue, just just uh, uh, north of the downtown main main intersection. But anyway, we kind of struggled through the uh, through the depression, I would say. But on the uh, with this class I took in the senior year, we worked a year out in the industry. And went to school a year. We alternated like back for a co-op program, co-op type thing. That's right. Yeah. But that was the first time that they'd started. Was 1938. They Good. started the co-op class. Good. Um, where Where were you living when when you moved from place to place? Did you live in apartments? Uh, yeah, apartments a couple times, but the rest of the time it was in usually double house, okay. double vacancies. And back during the depression. Uh, how did your house uh, usually get heated? Did you have coal furnaces or? or uh, yeah, we had. Uh, <laughs> we had. Uh, I don't think we had any 
gas furnace. I think all those coal furnaces, uh, uh, coal furnaces or a uh, stove, big pot bellied stove. Okay. Burned coke. The last, in fact, the last house I lived in uh, before I went in the Navy, it was a pot, kind of a big pot belly uh, stove with burnt coke. Use coke rather than coal. Uh, how about uh, bathroom facilities? Did you have uh, running water? Oh yeah, running water and and uh, and uh, bath. Uh, yeah. Didn't have any outside privies. <laughs> no, not not in Springfield. Good. No. Good. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, now, uh, so you, you graduated in 1940. Yeah, June of 1940. Yeah. And did you enlist or were you drafted? No, I enlisted. I went. Uh, well, I worked uh, when I uh, graduated. I was automatically given a job. I worked at the National Supply Company, which. Eventually it became why it changed hands a few times, but it was started originally by old Pat Shovelin. He's a well-known man here, and it was a diesel. It made diesel engines primarily and gas uh, engines for uh, oil fields. So they made. okay. So you worked there after high school. I worked there till uh, yeah. I, I started right after I graduated, and I worked till uh, December. And I that's when I went. And I served in the service. I enlisted in the service in 1940. Uh, so you were in the service uh, when uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Oh yes, I was. Yeah, I'd not had. Where were you? I'd had a year of service. Yeah. Where were you? I was in uh, Navy Jacksonville. Uh, after I went in the service, I went to Aviation Machines Mate School for four months. Where did and, you do that? In Navy Jacksonville. In fact, they just they just commissioned the, the air station at Navy Jacksonville in in forty. Okay. And. Uh, I went to school there for four months, and when I graduated uh, in June, I guess, of 1941, I was assigned to a PBY squadron, uh, the old P-boat squadron right. in the Navy Jacks. And okay, well, let me, uh, uh, let me go back and ask you, why did you pick the Navy rather than some other branch of service? I wish I could answer your question. I, I really don't know. Although I did have two good buddies that went in the Navy before me. I Maybe they formed a path for me. I don't know. But uh, anyway. Where did you go to sign up for the, for, for the service? Uh, the post office downtown. And uh, I went through, you know, a, a preliminary physical and all that sort of thing. And then I was, uh, we went to Cincinnati to actually sign up. There was 34 of us showed up at Cincinnati. How did you get to Cincinnati? Uh, bus, train? I think took a bus. I think we took a bus. But uh, there was 34 there and only 16 of us were selected because in those days they were a little... In fact, I had to have some dental work done before I could even go into the service. You know, they were pretty particular about who they took. Since, and, since we weren't at war then, they were a little, little more selective. Oh, yeah, oh yes. Like I say, 34 and only 16 uh, were passed that day. So. How, how were your uh, school grades? Did you have good school grades? Uh, good, yeah, generally very good in uh, certain things. I didn't care much about, unfortunately, about English. And that didn't set me on too much, but uh, math and uh, science and that sort of thing, I, I done quite well good. in, yeah. So from Cincinnati, you went where? We went uh, overnight train to Great Lakes. Up in Chicago? Uh-huh. Right. And how long were you up at Great Lakes? Oh, let's see, I think the, those days, I think it was, I think about 12 weeks, something like a 10, 10 or 12 weeks, something like that. What did you do up there? You know, I go through the usual stuff, a lot of marching and uh, parading around and uh, attended some classes, <laughs> but, and of course it was, I think the coldest winter they ever had in Chicago, it was terrible. We we done a lot of, a lot of marching out on the ice fields and that sort of thing, but uh, it was, uh, of course, they were, in fact, I think we were the last class. We still slept in hammocks. We didn't have cots. We had a, I think, four foot stands and we strung our hammocks between the. So that was uh, in a big barracks? It was, in fact, we were in the, they had some new barracks they'd built, but uh, they had some old brick building from World War I, I understand. It, it, it was about five or six of them surrounded a large field where they'd done the marching and that sort of thing. And uh, we were in those old Navy uh, World War I barracks. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, Colder than a mackerel. <laughs> so 
So, so uh, <clears throat> when you were up there at Great Lakes, did you know what you were eventually going to be assigned to do in the Navy? Did I? I'm sorry. <clears throat> when you were up there at Great Lakes, uh -huh. At that time, did you know what you were going to be assigned to do in the Navy? No, not really, until we, we took some uh, exams, I guess, of sorts, and from that, from that information, like pretty much like you're asking me about my career, they found out that I had worked in a, a machine shop and, and school, and I guess that's the reason why I was selected. That's the only thing I know about that. So from, from Great Lakes, you went where? I went right to, uh, after a little, um, furlough, went to Navy Jacksonville, and as I say, they had just started uh, Navy Jacks, in fact, I think, uh, FDR was there for the inauguration in the fall in the fall of 1940s, so it was a brand new air station and a new training uh, school, and uh, went right to school there, it was a four-month school. Did you have a girlfriend at that time? <laughs> yeah, in fact, the, the lady I was married to for 78 years, uh, who passed away here three years ago? We were childhood sweethearts. Went to, went all the way through, uh, through junior, junior high school high? and high school. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what, what's what was her name? Virginia. Virginia. Jenny. And they Nick, call her Jenny. Jenny. And, and uh, that's her. That's her picture right up there on the, her and I. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Uh, she was born, uh, you guys were married November 9th of 1941? Right. Where were you stationed at that time, down in Jacksonville? Still, still Jacksonville, yes. And I was uh, flying in the P-boats then. I was a flight engineer in PBY. What, what, what was uh, Jenny's uh, maiden name? Clay, Virginia, Virginia Clay, yeah. Where was she from, Springfield originally? No, she was born in uh, Bloom, Bloom Center. You ever heard of Bloom? You know where Bloom Center is? I think it's off the map now, but it's up <laughs> just south of uh, Indian Lake. It's a small crossroad, okay. you might say, called Bloom Center, Ohio. Yeah. Well, uh, how did she get to school in Springfield? Did her family move yeah, down? Her family moved, and she went, in fact, she, she went to Hayward, which is a junior high school out on the south side of town. she done her seventh grade, I think it was, uh, and they moved back, they moved down on West North Street here, and she went to junior high school with me then, Snyder Park, that's where I met her. Yeah. What, what did her dad do, you know? Uh, he was a, principally a house painter, he was a painter. Okay. And, and she had a lar larger family, she had uh, four sisters and a brother, so she was five in her family. So how'd you get along with her parents? Um, so, so. Okay. <laughs> how, how, how'd Jenny get along with your parents? Oh, okay. okay, okay. We didn't didn't get too much involved with parents as such. We were. So if, if Jenny was in the same grade as you, you graduated in forty. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, did she work after she graduated yeah, before she went, you got married? Yeah, she went to work at uh, Montgomery Ward. Used to be a store here, and they had a, a large store on uh, right next to the in fact next to the YMCA, and she worked in the. Uh, in the finance department, she was kind of a clerk in the in the finance department. Okay. Yeah. And did while you were in, in Jacks, did she continue to work there at Montgomery Ward after you got married? Oh no no, she worked there until, uh, you might say she she eloped. She came to Jacksonville on, on an overnight bus trip. Oh wow! And and uh, we were married in Jacksonville, a small town outside of Jacksonville by the. Justice of the Peace, but uh, you know, a funny story. I'd rented a car to go pick her up at the, the bus station in Jacksonville's down on the wharf, kind of a cruddy part of town, really. And uh, but that's where the Greyhound station was. And I, uh, she was supposed to arrive at eight o'clock in the morning, and I, I show up at eight, but she's standing on the corner with her bag. She, she got there early, I guess. <laughs> I, I was. I was scared from the fact that she was she'd actually arrived early and was all by herself there, but that's where I met her. Well, after you got married, uh, did she come back to Springfield or no, did no, they no, live together? Not right. She stayed with me until uh, I was transferred from uh, Navy Jacksonville. We were there. Uh, well, uh, in the meantime, of course, I'd uh, I'll have to tell you how I got into traffic control because that was at Navy Jacksonville. 
But I was flying, uh, when the war, after the uh, Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, I was promoted and I had, a, I was the plane captain of a PBY. Of course that was, you know, no, no wheels, it's strictly a flying boat. Right. And we had lost men out of the water. But I, uh, they took three of our airplanes, of our squadron, we were principally a training squadron, but they took three of our airplanes and assigned them with, uh, with the, the Eastern Fleet, uh, with the PBY squadron in, in uh, Norfolk and one in the Canal Zone, and we teamed up with those and flew sub patrol on the, in the Atlantic. And that's what I was doing then. Okay, now, were you actually on the plane? I was a flight engineer, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you're not the pilot, but what are you doing as a flight engineer? What was your job on board? Well, uh, basically, on, while we were flying, you, you had a, the, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it had what they call like a vein strut that sat below the wing and above the, the hull of the aircraft. Okay. And the, the flight engineer, there's a small strut there, and that's where the flight engineer sat. He had to go up about four steps of the ladder. And you controlled the wingtip floats, the uh, carbur carburetor settings, and uh, and you had to keep a record of, of all the instruments you know, while you were flying, you know, oil pressure and all that sort of thing. So it was strictly a, uh, an assist to the pilot in operating the aircraft. And you learned how to do that at Jack's? Oh yeah, I was through as a sec what they call a second mech. You had two mechanics aboard, and that's where I started out. The second mech kind of assisted in the, the plane captain, and uh, also when you launched it and re come out of the water, you, you made what they call the waste hatches, and you used to, to, to make the beach, you had to stream sea anchors to slow the, the aircraft down in the water, or whatever was necessary to get the aircraft from the water back to, to onto the beach. On, on the beach, yeah. So that was the second mech. But I've done that for quite a long time, for almost a year. How, how many uh, crewmen were there on the on the uh, PBY? Well, in the training, you know, you didn't need a navigator, just your local flying. But they had a pilot, co-pilot, a flight engineer, and a radioman, and uh, uh, the two mechanics. And if we had gunnery, then you obviously knew we had some extra from the waste hatches. We had 30, 30 caliber radios, and we had gunnery practice. So it, it depended on what the, the mission was, but generally, uh, generally it was just uh, landings and takeoffs at various parts of the, uh, the St. John's River, which is you know, quite a long river. Right, right. I've, I've got relatives that live just south of Jacksonville, so I get down there once in a while. Oh, really? Yeah. But, uh, now, were, the, were those uh, side guns, those 30, 30 caliber machine guns? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, were, were they? Manually operated, or were they? Yeah, they were on a. They had kind of a, a track, and it rotated on a, on a track out of out of the waste hatches in the back. Okay. For gunnery, but now also in actual combat, like in the Pacific, they had a tunnel had a tunnel hatch. They had a gun at the tunnel hatch, and uh, I think some of them had it off of the uh, rotating uh, bow. The bow they had a thirty caliber. Okay, uh, but. You're you're uh, you're on the uh, Atlantic side. Yes. And after Pearl Harbor, uh, did they activate you to do submarine? Uh, yes. Yes, we searches. Flew, yes, we we flew helped uh, the, the two squadrons, the one in Norfolk and the one in the Canal Zone. We we had an assignment from uh, about Brunswick, Georgia, which is in the southern part of Georgia. Right down to Great Exuma, which is uh, the southern, almost the southernmost uh, island in the Bahamas called okay. Great Exuma. All right. Uh, we, how far offshore were you flying for your sub search? Well, it kind of depended, but I would say uh, generally maybe 30, 40, 50 miles, probably max would be max, but a lot of times we were fairly close to the, the shoreline. And uh, that's quite a long flight from, from Brunswick to uh, Great Exuma. But uh, it, it kind of varied, but I'd say generally, uh, most of the time it was 15 to 20 miles offshore. So what was the general feeling there at Jack's when uh, you learned that Pearl Harbor had been attacked? <clears throat> well, I was, I was, because I was, I was uh, in the station. At that time, my wife had come back to uh, 
to some uh, problems with her parents. I forget what it was, but she wasn't there. I was I was staying in the barracks when actually when Pearl Harbor happened, and uh, I don't know what the the feeling would be. I say you know of course service people they they take usually whatever comes they yeah. they take it in stride, but uh, and I didn't have any really any real contact with the general public, so I, I can't say really, but uh, but we were gung-ho anyway, things changed, and uh, instead of giving uh, liberty every every uh, two or three times a week, you know, they went into what they call a port starboard, you get maybe go into town once, uh -huh. once in a while, but... But uh, not after that. Pardon me? <clears throat> not after that. No. So things tightened up a good bit, but that's when I say uh, they kept the training going, but that's when we activated the, the three-plane patrol squadron. And then, and then Germany declared war on us after Japan, yeah. and uh, were, your, uh, were your duties uh, intensified when Germany... Well, yeah, I think that's actually the, the German wolf pack, the submarine thing, is really what started our activity as far as that, the patrol. You know, there was a lot of different types. The, the Coast Guard was patrolling, um, and a lot of uh, uh, the squadron went to Iceland. So all around the East Coast, cause we lost maybe, I think, the, as I remember the number, something like 600 ships were torpedoed, and all along the coast. But most of them, because of, I guess, uh, oil, most of them was down in, more than toward the Gulf of Mexico and the uh, Caribbean Sea down there. Uh, but there were some, there were some sinkings all along the East Coast. Yeah, I've, I've uh, heard that the subs got real close and, and up, up, uh, up northeast towards Boston and, and New York. They didn't turn the lights out and the subs could uh, see the outlines of the ships from uh, the background lighting. That's very true and that, that was one of the things that there was a lot of complaints about. All along the East Coast, people weren't turning their lights out, the cities weren't turning their lights out, and that, that occurred all along the East Coast, really. So. During your patrols, did you ever see any uh, German submarines? Never saw any. Saw a couple, like I say, burning hulks that had been torpedoed, but and uh, we made a couple runs on suspect targets, but the activity where we were at was not all that intensive. Like I say, most of it seemed to be more south, down towards the Caribbean, and up and even up north, uh, up in the uh, northeast part of, of the country. When, when you were <clears throat> spotting for German subs, uh, did you have uh, any kind of electronic equipment, or or was it all uh, eyesight? Yeah, there was uh, there was no radar then, and uh, it was strictly all eyesight. Print, I'd say eyesight would be principally. And we of course flew our particular part. Of it, we flew at night. Usually about eight or nine hour flights from uh, endurance, but eight or nine hours. Usually take off right at sunset, and three or four in the morning we'd be back. Well, if you're looking for German subs by uh, by visual, uh, how would you expect to see one at night? <laughs> Just a periscope wake or something? Probably. I you know I really can't I can't answer your question specifically because I I really don't know. Uh, okay. I was pretty much involved with you know the instrumentation, the aircraft flying, and never got because when we made the made the sub patrols, we had a navigator aboard and uh, uh, an extra pilot and uh, just an extra crewman really. So I I didn't really get too involved in the you might say the intelligence of. You know. So uh, when you've got the wolf packs out there, did you have gunners on board your PBY then? Oh yeah, yes we did. We had uh, we manned uh, all the uh, gunning uh, gunnery stations. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, uh, and those were no blisters. They put blisters on before. before I mean, I'm sorry, afterward they put blisters on the, where the waist hatches were. We just had sliding waist hatches. You open those up, and and that's where the guns are. But later they came out and they put blisters with. Uh, I remember seeing pictures with the blisters. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, um, during during the uh, the flights, uh, did you have time to eat, or did you do your eating before you went on board and afterwards? No, they they packed us usually big big lunch, big uh, uh, 
sandwiches and coffee and that sort of thing. So How was the food? Oh, typical food. <laughs> typical food. Well, I've, I've heard guys say that Navy food was real good compared to what the ground pounders were eating. Oh, it was good. It was good, it was good but uh, it was typical uh, takeout sandwiches and that sort of thing. Uh, on, on a seven-day week, how many days would you be flying a uh, sub patrol? Well, we would, I would say we were average probably three, three about three times a week, because with a long patrol, you know, every every thirty hours, that airplane goes in for uh, a, a check. Every thirty hours, thirty, sixty, and so forth. So, uh, uh, you know, you make two or three flights, and you're on the you're on the deck then for inspections. What What did you do on non-flying days? We well, had maintenance around the aircraft, uh, different things you'd have to do, you know. Uh, uh, just routine cleaning many, up and whatever. How many engines were on the PBY-2? Two? Two, in, yeah, two engines. Do you know what? what 1830-64s, Pratt-Whitney, a good Pratt Whitney. air. Pratt-Whitney? Pratt-Whitney, yeah. 14-cylinder, 1830-64. Then how much they had... Uh, 900 and uh, about 950 horsepower, I think, each. So, what was the top speed for your PBY? <laughs> we, we used to kiddly say they took off at 60, cruised at 60, and landed at 60. <laughs> but now they, uh, we normally operated uh, 120 knots, 130 knots, something like that okay. in the cruise. Okay. But they weren't, they weren't fast, but they were. Uh, they brought you home all the time. A good airplane, that, very that, rugged. That was the uh, name of the game, was to get out safe and get back safe. Right, because they took a lot of beating when we were training before the, the sub patrol. You know, new pilots, we do what could call full stall landings, and usually they full they, they learn that so that they when they if they get in with the fleet, they have to land in the ocean. You know, landing one of those things in the ocean, you you land kind of downwind to catch the surf rather than trying to land into the into a, a surf. And you full stall it in, you have to learn to full stall it. So you normally land the slow it down and probably uh, maybe four or five feet off the water and then let it drop in. Uh -huh. But sometimes these newer pilots they, they level off maybe eight or ten feet, they drop in with we bust a lot of bust a lot of rivets. Slam <laughs> you down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how long were you down there, Jax? I was there until uh, the fall of 1942, and our squadron, because of our, you might say, our experience maintenance and flight crews, were all being transferred. We were decommissioned the training squadron, and they were being transferred to the Pacific Fleet, because that's when uh, uh, the Salmon Island campaign, Guadalcanal, was really hot. They used a lot of PBYs for well, air, air rescue, bombing, they used it for everything really, transporting them. So anyway, our squadron uh, was being decommissioned and I got a call, surprisingly, the, the airplane was in the hangar and I was working, doing something around it, and I got a call over the, the loudspeakers, uh, Petty Officer Muncie, report to the captain's office. Well, I was, I kind of took a post. White hats just don't normally go up to the captain's office to shoot the breeze, you know. Uh -huh. So anyway, I went up and he introduced him. Uh, I'd flown with him. He'd been on a couple of patrols with me, but he, he sat down and he said, uh, you know we're going to be decommissioned. I said, yeah. He said, you ready to go fight the war in the Pacific? I said, yeah, I'm ready. He said, well, I've been asked to nominate a, a man to go to the air traffic control school in, in Kansas City. It says it's, it's a civilian school run by the CAA. But said, uh, if you'd like to go, I'll recommend you. Well, I didn't know what air traffic control was, but I thought it sure in the hell beat, beat flying PBYs and out. Uh -huh. So I, I said, yeah, I'd like to go. So that's where I started my air traffic control. And I, I was completely divorced then from any kind of Navy flight operations. Okay, so what was, what was the CAA? Civil Aeronautics, that was before the FAA, it was called the Civil Aeronautics Administration. It was established in 1938, I think it was. Okay. Yeah. So, so where were you physically located then when you went to that Can training? In Kansas City, the 23rd floor of the City Hall building. We went to school from midnight till 8 in the morning. Uh, that's the only, because of the other uh, that civilian classes of the day and the evening watch. But we, uh, 
We went midnight to eight. It was a 10 week school on air traffic control. How many were in your class? Um, I got a picture on it. So I think it was probably about 10 of us, okay. eight or 10. Very, very small class. Eight, 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 hours, a, eight hours a night. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, seven days a week or five? Five days a week, yeah. We went five days a week. What did you do on your off days? Not much. I don't know. That, that, that's 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 like that. Because I was married then, and I yeah. didn't really. My wife, she stayed in Jacksonville. And, okay. Uh, uh, so I'm, not much. Where, where were your accommodations in uh, Kansas City? Well, um, the Navy had a place out at Ol called Olathe, Kansas. They had a Naval Air Station out at Olathe in Kansas, which was across the river from. Kansas City, Missouri, uh, but we got to uh, choose where we wanted you know, an apartment or a room or something. I had a room within, within walking distance of the city hall building, and uh, I had a room to stay there. Okay. Uh, and how about your meals? Did you eat them by yourself, or did you go on base and eat? Uh, ate wherever we wanted to. The rest, well, there's quite a few restaurants around downtown, and so it's. But who's paying for your meals? The Navy. They paid. They paid for our, our meals. How did How did that come about? Did you, let's say you go to Joe's Bar and Grill and you're going to eat there. Uh, did you have tokens or passes? No, you had to pay pay cash and then you were reimb reimbursed. You had reimbursed. Yeah, yeah, you okay. reimbursed. So how long were you in school there in Kansas City? Um, the, the school was. I believe the school was 12 week, 12 about 12 weeks long, 10 to 12. I forget exactly, 10, about about 12 weeks of things. Where did you go from there? Went back to Navy Jacksonville, and I went right into the sign right into the control tower at Navy Jacks. Okay, how long, where, how long were you there? Well, I was there about uh, almost a year, and then they we were commissioning a new naval air station. Uh, well, they had. We, the air station was there as a they were a PBY a PBM, uh, the big Martin, a different aircraft, but it's a big seaplane base, and uh, they opened the the uh, they, they commissioned the land base, the actual airport, and uh, we went down there and commissioned a new control tower to control the the uh, airport. All right. And uh, so you're living with your wife down there then? Oh yeah, we moved. Uh, and our son was born, and we we moved to uh, Cocoa, Florida. It's, well, actually, uh, we're Cocoa Beach. We're Cocoa Beach now. Cocoa Beach. Cocoa Beach. Well, Cocoa was over on the mainland part. Yeah. And uh, we lived in uh, Cocoa. We commissioned a new tower, and I was the controller in charge. There, I had to control uh, charge of the tower. Well, for someone is, that uh, is listening to this and watching this uh, years down the road. Uh, tell me and tell them what's involved in being the uh, operator of a control tower. What's involved? Yeah. Well, it's actually the separation, mainly the separation of aircraft uh, landing and taking off on the runways. And in those days, of course, radar had not been in, involved, so it's strictly a, an eyesight top operation, you know, everything by sight. And in, in bad weather, of course, you had uh, had procedures to take care of of instrument flying, but principally it was all we might say the biggest share of it was all visual flying and visual visual control of the actual landings and takeoffs of the aircraft. And what all aircraft were were landing in your control area? Well, we had a squadron of a uh, of Navy Beechcraft, that's in called SNBs, twin engine Beechcraft. You've probably seen them around there, few around left, but. They, it was a navigation school. They taught navigators there. Um, we had uh, F four Fs and F six Fs from uh, the, well, the Navy had a lot of air stations up and down the east coast of Florida. And then, but they had, we had uh, at Melbourne, which is very close to uh, Cocoa uh, Naval Air Station at Benin River. We had uh, they had a squadron of F four Fs or several squadrons, but they used our. Uh, they'd take off and then use our uh, air control uh, airport, which was fairly close by, to uh, for rearming their guns and so forth for gunnery practice. And then we had a squadron from uh, uh, Deland, and several squadrons on the East Coast used command and 
refuel and take off and go gunnery practice over the ocean, that sort of thing. Those F-4Fs, uh, they were smaller planes that could land, that uh, would, would be on aircraft carriers. Yeah, and then of course they, the forerunner, or the one after that was the F-6F, F, the F-6F, F, the wild, that was the, uh, the F-4F F was called a wildcat, it was smaller, been in, in use for quite a while, but then they went to the F-6F, F, which was much bigger, and it was the workhorse, really, of the, of the Pacific War, really. Is that called the Hellcat? There was a Wildcat and a Hellcat. Hellcat. The F-6F F was a Hellcat, and that was when it aboard most of the carriers in the Pacific uh, through, uh, through Hellcats. Well, during, during your operation of uh, your control towers uh, down there, did you ever have any planes that had accidents or near accidents? Uh, yeah, a surprising one. In fact, I was on the mic at the time. Uh, we used to have a, a, a squadron also in Daytona had what they call SBDs. It was a popular scout bomber, Bob Douglas. And uh, we had a guy, uh, for some reason, it was coming just a routine uh, cross country flight, I guess it was. And he was on final approach about three miles out. Uh, just a normal approach, about or two miles out. A normal approach. He was landing, and I can remember this very distinctly, he was landing east and suddenly just nosed off and went in into the water. I found, never did get the guy's name, but he was a, he was from uh, the Pacific Fleet. He was a, he was an ace, but he was an instructor pilot and he nosed in and like yeah. some, surprising. That's the only real close accident I can remember. Did anybody ever find out what caused him to do that? Uh, I, I can't, I don't recall really. Okay. I, I don't know. But, but he had been an ace. He was an ace, yes. He'd done a big tour in the Pacific and he was a flight instructor for the squadron in Daytona. Oh, well, that's a shame. Uh, get through all the battles and then uh, get, get, get killed like that. Yeah. Um, did BBYs go out to try to rescue him or was, was he? No, too close for that. Of course, we had a, a, a crash boat squadron right down below the tower, and they, they went out there, but uh, they recovered them. But uh, I don't think they ever found out exactly what caused the flight to quit or what. I really don't know. Well, uh, I'm looking at, at your bio that you gave me, and, and be initials before various stations is NAS. Is that Naval Air Station? Naval Air Station, yeah. So you were at Jacksonville, you were, yeah. at, you were at Banana River, right? Uh, Florida. You were at uh, Jan Rogers? No, John, that, actually, uh, NAS John Rogers is now the uh, Honolulu International Airport, but during the war, the Navy took that over. In fact, uh, I, don't know, I don't know the history, whether uh, they'd used that as a civilian airport before or not, I don't know, but Hickam is there, Hickam Air Force Base, it's all kind of, right together and uh, uh, but I was transferred after uh, in 1945 early spring I was transferred to the Naval Air Station at uh, in Hawaii in Hawaii I don't know. Uh, but I went into a uh, not a traffic control I went into a, as a dispatcher with the Naval Air Transport Service you know Nats Air of Nats they ran it was like the Air Command and uh, the Air Air Army Air Corps before the, they call it the Air Force, it was called Army Air Corps. And uh, I went as a dispatcher with the Naval Air Transport Service and we dispatched aircraft all over the Pacific. So what, what kind of aircraft were you dispatching? Oh, R4Ds, R5Ds, which is like a C-54. Uh, so these are a DC. supply Supply train planes or troop mostly, planes? Mostly trans, all transport, naval air transport. They they, they transport cargo, passengers, uh, that sort of thing. You know? what, what were your hours at that station? It, it was rotating type of thing. All twenty four hours a day, you had to shift work between you know day watch, evening watch, mid watch. Like pretty much like traffic control. Was what did you day. do? Pardon me. What did you do? What shift? Rotated, you know, we work maybe a week of days, then a week of afternoons, and a week of mids. Uh, hard to get used to uh, doing that, wasn't it? Pardon me? Wasn't it hard to get used to doing that uh, different shifts and trying to sleep? And... Uh, 
Huh? No, I worked uh, shift work all my life, practically in traffic control. You you don't work when you work. You rotate all the time. Okay. Even today, they rotate 24 hours a day, right. eight-hour shifts. So. Uh, then you were at Kisarazu. Yeah, I was at. Uh, I was there at, at, at Honolulu almost a year, and uh, after the signing of the peace treaty, of course, that's when the uh, occupation started of Japan, and we opened up a, a naval flight, a Tokyo Flight Service Center, and I was transferred to uh, Kisarazu uh, as a. Uh, it was still a naval air transport service, but a flight control center for, and we dispatched aircraft to uh, Guam, uh, Wake, Honolulu, all, all wherever the Navy was, the Naval Transport Service was there, and we. You know, we we done the dispatching of all those aircraft. And, and Kisarazu was spelled K-I-S-A-R-A-Z-U. And then we went to Haneda. I'm sorry, we went to Atsugi, and that's the naval naval base. It's uh, still there in existence. Naval Air Station at Atsugi. It's about uh, 15 miles west of uh, of <coughs> Tokyo. And it's a it's a naval air station yet today. In fact, it's uh, near Yokosuka. It's, it's the headquarters, pretty much, of naval activities in, in Japan. And uh, spelling I, of Atsugi was A T S U G I. Atsugi, yes. Uh -huh. Now, uh, when did you? Where were you when you found out that the atom bomb had been dropped? Let's see. That's in uh, forty. 45. 45. You had been in Hawaii, weren't you? I have to click my thoughts here just to where I was at in August of 45. It was on your bio. Your next assignment was there in Japan. Yeah, well, I was, I was, yeah, I was, well, after the, after, when the bomb was actually dropped, I was actually I was actually in Honolulu by then. Okay. Yeah, I was in Honolulu. And how did you get word that the bomb had been dropped? Uh, don't really recall. Do, do you remember any kind of a reaction that you and your buddies had? Well, I think pretty much, like everyone, the thing is over. The war is going to be over because they can't withstand that type of you know that type of bombing and. But uh, my recollection of that particular area, this is not too, well, not too sharp. It took two bombings before the Japanese decided they were going to, or right. at least the emperor decided it was going to. The emperor surrender. decided that, yes, right. How soon after that were you sent over to Japan? Well, that, 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 like I said, it was in 45, that was in uh, August, July and August, and I went to Japan in uh, November. Okay. Uh, when you were in Japan, did you see any uh, effects of the of the bombings of Tokyo? Oh, yeah, dec decidedly, yeah. decidedly, the firebombing of uh, of uh, let's see, it was in it was in March, I believe. The, the famous part of the bombing it was in March of that year, and it was some three hundred B fifty twos. Wiped out ten square miles of, 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 of Tokyo. Of well, a place called Funabashi. It's right next to Tokyo. It, they kind of one the same, but it was, I, and I drove by there many, many times. And it was flat except for a few chimneys sticking up. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I, I I saw that definitely. Tokyo itself was pretty much. They didn't do an awful <coughs> lot of bombing in Tokyo proper, well, around the castle. That's what was there? Where well, they did drop the bombs was that. Civilian area, or was that manufacturing area? Or? Pretty, I think, pretty much manufacturing, uh, aircraft manufacturing, and that that sort of thing. But it's it's a large area. In fact, Kisarazu is on the uh, on the east uh, shore of uh, Tokyo Bay, and we drove uh, to drive to Tokyo. You had to drive all the way around the bay. You pass through Chiba and Funabashi on the way to Tokyo. So, so I was by there many times. How about uh, Nagasaki? Did you? Uh 
Yeah. Were the never got down to that area okay. as, as such. No, that, none of the A bomb. Did Did you have any interaction with any of the Japanese citizenry? With the Japanese Japanese people. The oh yes, definitely. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, I got a little momentum over here. Um, a gentleman named uh, Tagami, Hiroshi Tagami. Uh, he he and his wife ran a, a little curio shop, and I happened to go in there one day and, and met them, but stopped by, and he was a graduate of the University of Hawaii, had graduated and was a good tennis player. In fact, he had joined a, an international <coughs> tennis troupe, uh, principally convoked a lot of Dutch people in it, but anyway, he had graduated and was touring with them and was in Japan when the war broke out and being Japanese and actually he couldn't leave. And he, he, he uh, for some reason, the physical part, he couldn't get in the service but he went into the intelligence type of thing and he, was, uh, and he spoke excellent English. But anyway, I met him and his wife and got to be quite friendly with him and uh, went to their home, so I was invited several times to their home, so I interacted <clears> with <throat> that particular family quite a bit. And, uh, so, uh, what was their reaction to the, to the atom bomb, if any? Well, he was, he was, he was, he was pro-English uh, American, that's for sure, because I guess having studied in Hawaii for four years or so, and, uh, and he, he told me about the Funabashi uh, bombing, it, uh, Funabashi was probably, by direct air, was probably maybe 10 miles. He said, I sat out in, in my yard at, uh, in the evening at 10, 9 or 10 o'clock dark, and I could, read the, I could read my book or read a paper with the light that was from the generated from that bombing. Yeah. Yeah. How, was, how was his food when you would go to his house to eat? How was his food? Uh, Typical Japanese food, you know, is... Uh, uh, Did you get to like it at all? Uh, yeah, all oh, some of it was very good. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Anyway, uh, my wife, later, well, probably later we'll talk about it. My wife also was over there and uh, later, uh, in the later years, and we went out, we liked the Japanese food, yeah. Good. Um, when you were in, uh, when you were in Honolulu, was your wife with you there? Not. No, no. Okay. When you went to Japan, did she come over there? That's, this is much later, many years yeah. later, yes. But yes. when you were stationed in Japan? No, no, no. I was in the military. She was never there, no. Well, how long was it between the time she saw your wife? Well, uh, I was gone... Uh, a couple of years, or did you have leave in the meantime? No. I was, I was trying to just think exactly when I left... Uh, when I left uh, Banana River in, uh, it was about a year and a half, almost, almost two years really, uh, and she stayed in Springfield. She, she came back to Springfield with my son, and she lived in, in Springfield with, with my parents, actually. Uh, okay. So, uh, when you left that Sugi, where did you go? Uh, we, we went over to Haneda, which is now the Tokyo International Airport at Haneda. It's very close to downtown, and the Air, the Army Air Corps, the Air Command, and Nats moved into Haneda, and I was there just a short time before I was discharged. I, we moved there, I think, in uh, July of 1946, and I was there until uh, about October, so I was only in Haneda, but we still was the Naval Air Transport Service, and uh, we just changed airports, really. But like I say, the day is now the uh, Tokyo International Haneda. Now. Then I see you went to NAB, is that Naval Air Base? NAB, A-D-A-K, is that well, that's, Alabama? That's, that's my, no, that's much, much later, that's much later. When I left uh, Japan, I was discharged from the Navy then. Okay. At uh, Treasure Island and, and uh, San Francisco. Well, how I, how I did, did you get from Japan back to the States? Plane or boat? Uh, we flew back. Flew uh, commercial or, or military? Military. Flew where, back. Where did you land? At uh, California or Washington? 
no, in California, I'm trying to think of the name of the air, air big air, air base at, uh, close to San Francisco there, okay. but between San Francisco and, uh, and Sacramento. Uh, but, but then, uh, uh, how'd you get home from California? By train. How long, how long a trip was that? <laughs> I don't, I don't, Two or three nights? A couple of nights, I think. I, I kind of forget just exactly. Was that a commercial uh, or a troop train? No, commercial. Just I was I was discharged. In fact, I was uh, I planned on staying in the Navy really, and I because I liked I wanted to stay in air traffic control, and uh, my in my exit interview, I I said I I'd, I'd stay in the Navy and, and in this right now if you could guarantee that I could stay in air traffic control, at least we we can't guarantee because. Doing it. At that time, that's why I had two different ranks. I was an aviation machinist mate, even though I was working in the tower and traffic control, because the regular Navy did not have a, a rating for traffic control. They did for reserves, quote, the specialist Y. So when the reserves came in during the war, they gave them a specialist Y, which was air traffic control. But being regular Navy, I couldn't, I couldn't change. So I said, well, the, the, the in fact, I, I was. Exit interview was by a four striper captain in the Navy, and he said, Well, he said, I can't guarantee. So we probably could you probably get back in. He said, I can't guarantee it. I said, Well, I so I, I said, I'll join the reserve, and I joined the re Naval Reserve just to make sure that I could maybe get back in if I had to. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the meantime, when I got home, I the first week I was home, I went overnight train to Chicago and parked myself on the doorsteps of the CAA and got an interview and was hired that morning. So <laughs> I was hired while I was, I was still on, on, I was still on terminal leave and got hired and then, so that's when I left the Navy, except for the Navy, I was in the Naval Reserve for four years. Well, uh, when, you, when you came home from California, uh, did your wife know you were coming? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Did your parents know you were coming? Oh yeah. yeah. What, what kind of a greeting did you get when you got off the train? I should remember that, but I really can't. It was, of course, it would be a very cordial and oh, yeah. after all I've been gone that long. Do you remember your son being uh, there to greet you? Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, did he really know you? Because you were gone most of uh, practically all his life. He had, he probably didn't recognize me as such because yeah. he yeah. was very young when I left. And Were you in uniform when you came back, or civilian? Yeah, I was. I was still in uniform. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So your your wife and son were living with your my parents. With your yes. parents at the time. Yeah, so when had, you came back, did uh, you stay there for a while? Well, I stayed there for a while, but I went right to work at Port Columbus, Ohio, at, at the old control tower oh. at the old uh, airport in Columbus. Oh. What, what period of time we're talking about, uh, 46 that's, or 47? That's, uh, I went to, went to work while I was still on terminal leave of the Navy in 1946, late 46. Yeah. Well, I was born in Columbus and I lived in Bexley, which was... I'm sorry? I was born in Columbus and I lived in Bexley. Oh, we're in Bexley? And my dad used to take me out there. It was, that airport was really a dump. Oh yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was a pretty busy airport. In fact, I got, Surprising, it was the fifth busiest airport in the United States when I was there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like they had 50-some flights a day. <laughs> well, well, I, I love prop planes, and my dad used to take me out there and I'd watch planes. TWA take, and American, particularly. Take off and land. And where did you live when you were working at Port Columbus? Well, I, I lived, still lived in Springfield, and I, and I had an aunt that lived out on uh, hill, Hillside, Hilltop, on, w west, on the west side. Uh, west side, and I stayed with her. Uh, uh, two nights a week, and then the other time I commuted back and forth. I interviewed a World War II veteran, his wife, uh, I don't know if you remember, there was an Army General Depot in the east side of Columbus. No. Oh. Well, his wife worked there, oh. so they lived in Bexley. Oh, yeah. And I asked him where he lived, what street he lived on, he said he lived on Remington Road, which is the same street I lived so on when I was a kid. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I asked you where you lived in, in Columbus. Yeah. But I had an aunt that lived out on, on the hilltop. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you go up to the CAA and you get hired immediately and you, you're sent down to Port Columbus. Right. And how long did you stay in Columbus? I was just there about a year and I was, uh, I was an assistant controller. Of course, you went as an assistant, making uh, 
$2,500 a year. <laughs> anyway. Not big money. <laughs> there was a vacancy that came uh, open in uh, Dayton, so I transferred to the Dayton Control Tower. And that was another dump. It wasn't, wasn't much of an airport then, either. Well, you know, surprisingly, uh, it wasn't real busy, but it, the size of the airport was, uh, except for the new runway they built, was the same, same old airport, really. When I went to the University of Dayton, and uh, my first time I ever flew, I flew out of the, the, uh, the Dayton airport. Oh, really? Yeah. It, it, was, yeah. it was no piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> and I, but, I think it was uh, an airplane that had tricycle landing gears. It was yeah. commercial. Yeah. I can't remember the, the brand of airplane it was. But then I also flew a couple times with Purdue Airline. They had the old... Uh -huh. The old uh, DC three or fours, uh, tail draggers. Yeah, right. Yeah. DC threes probably. Well, uh, so you're in Dayton for how long? I was in Dayton two years, and uh, then the uh, CA decided to. I mean, I, mean, I shouldn't say the CA, the uh, Michigan government decided to. Uh, really opened up the uh, the field in Lansing, the capital of Lansing, Michigan, and they didn't have a tower, so they built a tower there, and we commissioned a new tower at uh, Lansing Airport. And I was a I was the senior controller there, and we had uh, uh, all three or four new brand new people and, and a few four a uh, couple older controllers, but we commissioned a new tower there in um, April of nineteen. 50. Uh, 49, I'm sorry. 49. So, 49. Are, are you controlling just military planes or commercial? Oh, no, it was also? strictly civil. There was, civil? Uh, yeah, Capital Airlines, the old Capital Airlines, which is now defunct, uh, operated through there. And uh, Nation, there was a, a, a small airline called Nationwide Airline. I think they only had two or three airplanes, but they used to run between Detroit City and the uh, the iron mines up in Upper, upper Michigan. Michigan. Yeah. Iron City and Iron Mountain, I think it is one, but uh, but it was a, a fairly busy airport. A lot of a couple flying schools there. So How long were you there? Huh? How long were you in Lansing? Well, I got there in April with commission, and then the following June I get the letter from or July, whenever Korean War broke out, I get a letter from the Navy it says you're now <laughs> entitled to come back and join us for a while. So you're no longer reserve. You're I was active. a silver. My reserve was just about over, and I got extended for another year. So, <laughs> so, so I, uh, I went back in the Navy then. And where did you go? I went to uh, Naval Air Base Adak, Alaska, in the Aleutians. Okay. And uh, the Navy had just taken over. The, the Navy had a command there. Where they were principally a communications area for the northern area, you know, against Russia and all that sort of thing. Uh, it was principally communications, and they had the early warning there. But the, the Army Air Corps had ran the uh, the, air, the, uh, the airport itself. But the Navy took that over, and it became a naval air base. And uh, what was that located? Uh, was that along the coast, or was that interior? Well, Adak, Alaska is only a chain. The chain's about a thousand miles, runs from Alaska all the way to Russia, practically. And uh, Adak is at the bottom of the chain. It's about a thousand miles from from uh, Anchorage, oh, down wow. down at the bottom of the chain. It's wow. the last one, and it kind of bends and goes up towards uh, Shemya and uh, the Komodorsky Islands, I guess, in Russia. But uh, it's uh, is that the same chain that the Japanese uh, Kiska and that too? Had too. In fact, they uh, they at one time I think bombed ADAC, but they they stayed away from ADAC. They went to Dutch Harbor, and bombed Dutch Harbor, and then they actually invaded Attu for a yeah. short period of time. ADAC to Attu is probably about 500 miles or so, but the chain is quite long there. Did you ever get up to Dutch Harbor? No, no, I never. Uh, I flew into uh, ADAC when I when I was transferred there. Flew in. And uh, with a, again with a Navy air transport out of uh, Washington, but uh, and I left in a ship when I came back. But I was there. When I took over the tower and had all new 
new employees, new, new controller, the, the controller, they were all reserves called back in. And then, and since I was CA and had what they call approach control experience, nobody else had it on the base. So when I arrived, the administrative officer said, well, said, uh, we've taken over, but we've taken over something we don't know how to operate. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, uh, uh, we talked a while, he said, well, what, what I'd like for you to do, he said, I'll, in the control tower, there's on the third floor, there's a vacant area, so if you can decorate that anyway, you live there. So I lived in the control tower for a year, solitary, by myself, except for the controllers. Uh -huh. And I stayed, uh, I stayed in that time. And I ate my dinner, meals with the next door was the crash crew, they, and uh, they used to bring the food down to the crash crew, and I ate with the crash crew. Well, did, uh, did, did you have to uh, do additional training of these newbies? I absolutely, I'm glad you asked, because I had about a, a month training uh, of all, of course, they, they worked in towers, but they had no approach control experience, uh, instrument traffic, because of the terrific weather that ADAC enjoys. Uh, we had a lot of instant weather, and we had a Reeves Airline, a guy named Bob Reeves started years ago, a Reeves Airline used to come in two or three times a week, and he flew the chain. In fact, when he first started out, he flew the chain in an old Stinson, gull wing Stinson. He flew that ADAC, and that's the world's worst weather along the oceans. But he graduated and had DC-3, and uh, later they went, he, well, they're, they're still, I think, I, sent, I think they're still working there, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, uh, we had uh, not too much traffic, but it was, uh, the weather was terrible all the time. Do you have any mishaps while you were up there at ADAC? Uh, no, not, not weather wise or otherwise. No, not really. Nothing that stands out in my mind. No, nothing, uh, nothing unusual, except the the weather. I remember the weather. Um, how how bad would the snow be when you were up there? Snow, not surprisingly, not much snow. You know, the the, the weather in the ADAC varied between. Uh, I say the lowest I ever saw, saw it was 18 degrees. And in the summertime, we get up to 50, maybe on the case day and sun. But a lot of fog, and uh, snowfall was not real heavy as far as depth or anything. We could we could maybe get four or five inches or so, but it would uh, it would kind of disappear. Did you have high winds. Average wind speed in ADAC is something like 20 knots, and the the tower that I lived in was was an old tower from I don't know when it was built. But it was anchored by four uh, one-inch cable on each side of it. It was a five, a four-story structure. We had four one-inch cables tying it down on each side, and it's still kind of weak. It was like being aboard ship, really. <laughs> and it, it blew all the time. Yeah. And of course, they have what they call willy was. You'd be walking into it. And all of a sudden, you go this way, and it blows this way. They're called woolly was a very unusual type of weather conditions. Huh. <laughs> so anyway, I, I I really remember my year in ADAC. So, uh, how did your little private uh, room? How was that heated? We had a we had a, a boiler room down at the base of it. It was uh, it was a. Uh, Hot water, hot so water. So you had steam heat. Yeah, it's steam heat, like hot, I think steam or hot water. But yeah. it was. Had a radiator in the it, room. It, right, right, yeah. that radiator. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's where you were during the Korean War. That's where I was on the Korean War, and I, I was there just a little over a year, and I guess they determined they didn't need reserve anymore, so I I left and I was out of the Navy. I was clear of the Navy, but. So did. Did you have any uh, anything to do with the Korean War operations, uh, communication well, wise, or well, anything? Uh, you know the Great Circle route. If you, when you fly an airplane, you don't fly. Uh, you could fly a Great Circle, one of the long, long oceanic flights. So uh, we were on the Great Circle route between uh, well, both Anchorage and uh, Korea, uh, Japan, and the West Coast, all the West Coast traffic. So that was along the Great Circle. So we were there principally as a, as an alternate airport or an emergency airport as far as the 
Korean airlift was concerned, but that was that was only really only effort you might say that we were involved with the Korean. <coughs> but did you have some of the transports? Uh, yeah, we had landing? some of the land there. That's right. In yeah. fact, we had a couple of uh, North emergency landings by Northwest Airlines. In fact, I talked with the captain after he landed. He said he'd never been through such a final approach. We had a radar, but then we had what's called GCA. We had a GCA unit there. What does that stand for? Pardon me. What does Ground G Control Approach GCA, and, and then it became with the uh, with the uh, something they called PAR Precision Approach Radar, and uh, all of those places. Uh, and we had when, when I was in Cleveland, we had a PAR unit there. I was a precision controller. But uh, anyway, uh, you were talking to the captain, and he said he never had. He never had such a final approach to the. And it took them over at 8,000. We controlled traffic. We controlled not only the tower tra the airport traffic, but we controlled the en route traffic within 200 miles. And other than that, then the, and the Anchorage Control Center handled all the high altitude stuff. But, but 8,000 below we handled. But we, uh, he said he never had such an approach because of the turbulence and uh, had rather low visibility. He said that was one of the worst approaches he'd ever made in his life. Uh, uh -huh. Now, would you have verbal communication with the planes coming in to land? Oh, oh yes, yeah, we just regular, yeah, sure did, en route, some uh -huh. of the route traffic, yeah. Uh, did, did you get to know any of the pilots that were flying back and forth? I got to know, I'm trying to take his name, a captain, he was a captain on Reeves Airline, he was a real nice guy. He used to come up to the tire and we'd shoot the breeze a little bit and everything. But that's the only ones I really got to know. Uh, he was, uh, in fact, he was the leading captain of Reeves Airline. Um, I, I can't think of his name. And that's the Reeves Airlines, the one that flew down the chain. Yeah, right. But was he supplying uh, uh, little communities down the chain? Yes, I, I don't know. He supplied uh, Shemya, which is out at the end of the chain. Uh, I don't know. There, I don't really know. The breakdown between how passengers versus versus cargo, but there weren't all that many passengers in, uh, flying the chain then, so it was pretty much a cargo operation. And uh, they landed at uh, I think Dutch Harbor. They went into Dutch Harbor, Coal uh, Coal Bay. I think they uh, that was basically the, the they were based in Anchorage. Okay. Uh, so you uh, you got out in December second of fifty one. Fifty one. And you took a ship uh, <clears throat> from ADAC uh, back to Seattle. To right. Seattle. Yeah. How'd you get from Seattle home? Train or plane? Another, another train. Yeah, another train ride. The commercial. Yeah, right. Just a regular commercial line. Yeah. So uh, back back at that time, did they have compartments, or did you have to sleep in your seat? Uh, we slept on our. In our seat, we didn't have any compartments. Uh, the only compartment we ever got was when we were going in the Navy. They treated us from, <laughs> from Cincinnati to Chicago. We really got a nice, nice deal, you know. But that's the only time. <laughs> the rest of the time, they give you some money, and you get you're on your own, kind of. <laughs> so, uh, uh, when you came back from uh, from Washington, uh, where did you come to? Springfield? No, my uh, my wife. Uh, of course, she was a been driving a long time, but she'd never been driven in a big city. But we had a, uh, a fairly new car that we bought in Lansing before I went back in Korea. In fact, it was a 1950 uh, Chevrolet. We paid $900 for it with air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> I anyway, she kept the car and while I was in, in uh, Alaska. <clears throat> but anyway, she met me. She drove to Chicago had never driven in a big city or anything, but she drove all by herself. She met me in, in Chicago, and uh, I had, of course, I had to check in with my our uh, regional office was in Chicago then. I had to check back in there and take a few tests and get, get ready to go back to work. But uh, I'd seen, I, I'd been in traffic control a while, but I'd seen, the, and radar was r very new then. In fact, I have to back up a little bit. When I was in Banana River, we had, we had a project called Project Baker, and it was secret. And they had a, their own little building, and everybody stayed away from it. But they were con perfecting ground control, GC precision approaches, and they never even told me what they were doing, uh -huh. except we did 
have to sometimes close a runway and they make approaches, but they were developing GCA, precision approach radar then. And when did you find out what they were doing in that building? Not, not, not while I was there. When I got when I got to Japan, they perfected, the, uh, and we had a, G, a GCA unit at Kisilazu. So <laughs> anyway, he. Uh, uh, so you meet your wife in Chicago. I met my wife in Chicago, and we <coughs> had to go, of course, to live it up a little bit. We went to college in for dinner and bands and all that sort of thing. And uh, uh, I decided, but anyway, I decided that radar was a coming thing for traffic control, even though we just use it for, for precision approaches. And uh, I didn't want to go back to Lansing. We liked Lansing, but it was, wasn't too busy. And there was an opening in Cleveland. And at that time, Cleveland had, uh, Cleveland Tower was one of the only three or four uh, airports in the country that had radar. And they had precision radar, and I said, "Well, that's what I want." So I took a, a voluntary downgrade from my original uh, uh, grade that I had with the, the with the uh, government before I left. I took a downgrade to get back into Cleveland. So I took a, a downgrade to get back, and I I came back to Cleveland and was there about eight years. So. So. Instead of making twenty five hundred dollars a month, they downgraded you to twenty. Well, well it was a little, a little bit more than that then, but it was a month. I mean, but it was a step, a step down anyway. Back. <laughs> so. So you were in Cleveland how long? Nine years. I was there eight years. Eight years. Yeah. I was, a, I was an, <laughs> an assistant chief when I left her when I went to Washington. So, yeah. so anyway, she met me in Chicago, and we lived up for three or four days, and came back, and and we were here just. To, Few weeks we moved to Cleveland. We well, didn't live in Cleveland. We lived uh, outside of Cleveland, and we liked the rural areas. We had a nice rural area, a little place called Columbia Station. It's about near Berea, Howard, Baldwin okay. Wallace Colleges. Yeah. Uh, we lived there for eight years. Okay. Now, in addition <coughs> to your son that we haven't talked about, what was your son's name? Ronald. And Ronald uh, uh -huh. has, has passed away. But tell, tell us a little bit about Ronald. Uh, uh, how far did he go in school? Did he go to did he graduate high school? Oh yeah, he uh, he started. We started out. He showed a tendency for uh, uh, liking music, and we started him out in piano lessons when he was about six years old mm -hmm. here in Springfield. Well, when I come back, I, actually he yeah when I came back from the from Japan the first time, we started him at, when he started grade school. He started taking piano lessons, and he went through. Uh, uh, grade school here. To, we, of course, we moved around again a lot, but uh, between here and Troy and Cleveland. But he stayed with his piano. And uh, when I went to uh, to uh, Washington D.C. from Cleveland, uh, he uh, he he went with us. But he graduated high school in uh, Annandale, Virginia. Okay. And. Uh, <clears throat> I was, of course, at the, I was in the headquarters of Washington for a couple of years. And that's where we lived in Annandale, in, uh, uh, Annandale Virginia. But uh, did he go on to college? Then he went on to college. Yes, he went to uh, he went to Baldwin Wallace for he'd been studying privately with a professor at Baldwin Wallace and uh, a guy named uh, Walter Hassemann, a great German pianist. And he'd studied privately, but then when he graduated, he we we transferred to Hawaii. Then that was 1965. So you go from Washington D.C. over to, to Hawaii. Hawaii, yes. Where in Hawaii? Big Island or where? Uh, in uh, Honolulu. Our regional office was in uh, in in downtown Honolulu. And when you say regional office, of who? With the Civil Aeronautics Administration, well, FA went FA then. Yeah, you know, had gone. They changed from CAA to FA in 1958. So it was okay. it was the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, and we had a regional office. It was in the Asia Pacific region. So did he move office. with you? Did he move with you to Oahu? Well, he he moved with us, but he wanted to come back to go to school, so he came back and went to Baldwin Wallace, <coughs> and he was Baldwin Wallace for a year, and they had a big 
November snowstorm, about 15 inches of snow, and he suddenly wanted to come back to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we arranged that he he came back to uh, and enlisted in the uh, enrolled in the uh, University of Hawaii and studied there for for three. So he graduated as a, with a bachelor of piano and organ music. And then what did he do work wise? Pardon me. What did he do work wise? He went to work at Punahou Preparatory. It's a high school. It was built originally for uh, by the. The, uh, I want what the term is, but uh, um, anyway, it's a high school, prepared high. In fact, Barack Obama went to school there, oh. but my son went to school there and the faculty teaching piano and organ. Barack went there because your son had gone there, probably. <laughs> or vice versa. Yeah, I guess it, I guess it was. It was after the son. Yeah. <laughs> so he he taught there, and he was still teaching when I I'd done five years in the regional office in Holland, and he was still he he stayed there after we left. We came back. Uh, uh, did he marry? Yeah, he was married, and well, what's uh, his wife's name? It was Jap he married a Japanese lady, okay. Isako. He's our yeah. He married a Japanese lady, and uh, do you have kids? Do you have grandchildren by them? No, no, he <clears> had no <throat> children. Okay. But he, uh, in addition to teaching, he, like most musicians, he played in a couple bands in, uh, on Waikiki and different places around. And he was a accompanist to the Honolulu Male Chorus. He, he he was then about four or five years. He was a great musician. Consequently, he was a heavy smoker and. Being in nightclubs and that sort of thing, he developed COP. COPD. PD. Uh, that, and that's eventually what he passed away from. On he lived here for on this in this building, as a matter of fact, uh, for about a year. In this building, we're here at the Masonic Home. I'm sorry. We're here at the Masonic Home. Yeah. In Springfield, in Ohio. Spring, Springfield, Ohio. Yeah. And when did you come here? Uh, <coughs> well. Um, we moved here, uh, I guess a very long story. We actually moved in here in 2005. Uh, I retired in 1977 and we, we went to Grass Valley, which is in the Northern Mines area, it's called the Northern Mines, Grass Valley, California. It was the northern end of a 350 mile mother <coughs> road that ran <coughs> along the foothills of the Sierras where all the gold was okay. discovered. Anyway, we lived there for a while and uh, what what we, had taken you there, that particular place? I'm why, sorry? why did you go to that particular place? Well, we uh, we had a, when I uh, was working in the, in the Bay Area, to get away from the telephone calls, the noise and everything, we built a, a mountain home up in near Yosemite. And on the weekends, my wife and I took off and with my daughter and, and uh, We'd spend the weekends there to get away from it. I had no telephone, didn't have to talk with anyone, we just played golf. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we we built another, uh, we had that for a while, and we finally built another one up in a place called uh, Lake Wildwood, just near Grass Valley. And we built a uh, second home, and we used that on on some weekends. We finally, when I retired, <coughs> we moved there permanently. So we lived there permanently 13 years. In the Grass Valley area after I retired, but my son. In the meantime, my son uh, decided to come back to the mainland, and he came back in uh, oh, about mid mid seventies. Before I retired, a couple of years before I retired, he came back from Hawaii, and he worked in a music store in uh, a little town just outside of Sacramento, and also taught. He had he had a studio, little studio, and he taught there. So. So he was there for several years, um, and he, uh, he eventually moved up to uh, uh, probably escape my recollection the name of the town. But anyway, he lived up there for a while, and uh, his wife passed away. And in the meantime, we <coughs> decided to come back to Springfield after 50, being gone 59 years. We decided to come back to Springfield because my mother was a, 
a resident here for about eight years. Okay. And I've been gone so much, we wanted to spend a little time with her, so my wife and I decided we'd just come back to Springfield too. So we both came back to Springfield. And, and, and that was about when? Uh, 1999. 99, your mom was still living. Yeah, she. How about your dad? Did he pass he away? He passed away in 80, 82, yeah. Okay. But he was never a resident here. But he used to volunteer to push the ladies to the beauty shop. He didn't volunteer work here. But my mother actually moved here uh, in uh, about 1992. So he was, he was here about eight years before she passed away. So you visited her here and you saw what a nice place this was. Oh, yeah. And uh, you and your wife decided to move here. We decided to move back. We actually moved back. To, we didn't live here. We moved back in the private sector. We lived out on the north side of of, uh, of Springfield in a, in a condo for about, we were there about six years before we decided to come onto the, onto the campus because my <coughs> wife was, her, uh, she'd been diagnosed with uh, mild cognitive impairment okay. and she started a forerunner of, of, of Alzheimer's. So we decided, and she'd had a couple of bad falls and we decided to move out, move out here. So we moved out on the campus at, 2005. So I've been here 17 years. Yeah, good. Oh, good. Long time. You have a nice little apartment here. Oh yeah, well we had a beautiful apartment up on the fourth floor. It was uh, a two bedroom and had a nice balcony out over the, it was like I was working in the tower. I could let her look over the whole thing. <laughs> you could direct all the pedestrian traffic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then we lived there for uh, about three years till she started getting real bad. and. Uh, and then she passed away. I, six weeks before she passed away, we, we moved out of the apartment, moved her down into the Alzheimer's unit, and she passed away six years later. Six, uh, six years? Weeks, six, six weeks. I'm sorry, six weeks later. But I decided I didn't need that big apartment, so I, I moved down here then. I, so I've been in here about three years. And uh, so. When did your wife die? What was her date of death? Her what? What was your wife's date of death? When did she die? What oh, uh, September the... Uh, seventh of nineteen. Nineteen two thousand nineteen. Yeah, three years, just a little over three years ago. And when did your son Ronald uh, die? He passed away in six in sixteen. Twenty sixteen. Okay. So just three years bef uh, after uh, before my wife. Yeah. Oh, now, so Ronald, uh, he uh, he was seventy four years old when he died. Uh -huh. Uh, and how old was your wife when she died? She was 90, well, two and nine, she was 97. She was almost 98. Uh, and how old are you now? Well, on you, the... You were the born in 22, so you're almost 100. The 29th of October, I'm going to have a big celebration. I'll celebrate my 100th birthday. Great. You're going to celebrate it here on campus? Yeah, we have a nice clubhouse here, a big clubhouse, and we have that reserved for the Saturday the 29th. But prior to that, on the, uh, October the 14th, my daughter, who lives just about five minutes south of here, she's retired, uh, her and I and her friend that she lives with were flying to Lake Tahoe. My oldest grandson is getting married, and we're going to go out there for about 10 days oh, nice. to, to his wedding. Nice. Yeah. Now, we haven't even talked about your daughter. What was her <laughs> name? Uh, Diana. And when was she born? She was born in uh, July, well, you, you, you really pressed me now, July the 29th, 1953. Okay, she's 69 years yeah, old. Yeah, she's 69, right. Yeah. And uh, was, was Diana married? Yeah, she was married and... Uh, what, was her, what was her married last name? Well, she was married twice. Hallmeyer uh, uh, was, uh, and she had two children. Uh, Hallmeyer was her was name, and then she married uh, uh, a uh, Glasgow. Uh, uh, last name is Glasgow. Her name is now Diana Glasgow. She married a Glasgow. G L A S C O W. Like, yeah, like, in, like in Scotland, yeah, Glasgow. Uh, uh, Hallmeyer. <coughs> How do you spell that H? H like Hall H A W L M E Y E R. M E Y E R. Okay. Hallmeyer. And, uh, but now, and Has she, she worked? Has huh? she worked during her life? Oh yeah, she worked all the time. <laughs> what kind of jobs did she have? 
oh, I don't know, many. She, she, uh, she went to college and she was a uh, dental assistant. Where did she go to college? At uh, Diablo, I think it's called Diablo Valley College in California. Diablo, uh, Diablo Valley College in California. And, uh, but you said she lives near here? She moved, yeah, she moved from, uh, she and her husband moved to Texas for a while and then she finally moved back here and she lives on, uh, uh, just five minutes south of here on, uh, uh, on Route 68? No, on uh, Turnpike, the... Uh, oh, Route, uh, route uh, 70? No, I'm sorry. 40? Oh, sorry, <laughs> it's, it's a road that goes between 68 and 675 goes towards Fairborn, uh, oh, okay. Fairfield Pike. Okay. Oh, Fairfield Pike. I came just, past it's that. just south of here. But I came um, past that uh, when I came to see you. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. So anyway, my 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 uh, son got COP very very bad, and uh, he lived here about on the campus almost two years, and. When they opened this up and I think they opened this in, up in uh, about five years ago, f 15, 2015, I think it was opened. Uh, he moved. When you say this, are you talking about this? Unit? This particular part, okay. yeah. This is new, yeah. built in 15, about 15, I think. Okay. And he moved here, and he would live here almost two years before he <clears> passed <throat> away with COPD. Yeah, that's that's a tough disease. I, on your bio, I see uh, California history at Columbia College. Yeah, of course I. Uh, we we moved from uh, we lived 13 years in Grass Valley, and we decided well let's try the southern line. So we moved down to a town called Sonora. It's uh, about 100 miles due east of San Francisco, it's in the foothills, and we moved to a new house in Sonora, California, and Columbia College is a. Uh, Columbia is a little small town. It's a mining town. They have a, a, a college called uh, Columbia College there, mm -hmm. and uh, they offered uh, uh, different uh, adult, education. adult education. And I, I'm always been kind of a history nut anyway. The Civil War and all. Uh, I, I enjoy that sort of thing. So I decided to take a course in California history, which was very interesting, and. Uh, it was a credit course, but I wouldn't want to some credit because right. I... Almost, almost like an audit, huh? <laughs> so, uh, you, 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 right. mentioned, you mentioned history. Did, do you have any long ago relatives that were in any military uh, operations? Civil War, or World War I, or mm -hmm. Spanish-American War, anybody? No, my, my, yeah, my, uh, I had a cousin that, uh, he ran a Muncie Corporation here. He, when he, he was in World War II. He was, he, in fact, he was in the PBY squadron. He was a radioman, who in PBYs, a radioman. Uh, he was involved in the. Um, he went, in fact, he was on a carrier. He was on the, on the, uh, the carrier when they launched um, the, the Tokyo raids, the Tokyo Raiders. Yeah. Of the, I, I had lunch with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Cole before oh, he died. Okay. He was Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot. Co-pilot. Okay. Well, anyway, my 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 cousin he was just a, he was a radio man, but he was aboard the that was a Hornet. Yeah. And uh, then he transferred from there. He went to radio went back to radio school, I think it was, and then he transferred into he was in the PBY squadron in the Solomons, and he oh. flew quite a few. Missions in the yeah. in the Solomons, but anyway, when he came back out, he got out of the Navy. He and his uh, brother-in-law ran a open <coughs> small business, little machine shop down near downtown Springfield. But they finally developed, and he done quite well. He had a, a factory here in Enon, and manufactured uh, uh, window uh, operation for cars. Okay. That's before you had the automatic, you had a robot. But he had a nice bit, and he. Uh, what was his last? What was his name? Randall Muncy. Randall Muncy. Okay. The Muncy Corporation, and uh, that's the only only relative that I'm aware of that was really involved in any type of thing. But uh, 
Well, let me run through some of the medals and rewards you got with American American Defense Medal. Yeah. American Theater. Right. Uh, the Asiatic Pacific. Right. Victory Victory Medal. Right. You got a Naval Occupation. Right. And you got Korean War. Right. Recognition. And you got good conduct. Oh yeah, good conduct. That's, <laughs> that's important. <laughs> that's the reason he has a gold rating badge. Pardon me? That's the reason you have a gold rating badge. Yeah, well, 11 years in the Navy, and Navy Reserve is the gold, is the gold part. Right. And I had, like I said, I had two different, when I was in the regular Navy, I, I, even though I was working in traffic control, I couldn't get a space supply, so, but when I, when I went into the reserves, when I was in Cleveland, I got a notice from the Navy that your rating has been changed now. You're now a air controlman chief. So that's why I have two different ratings. <laughs> Chief, when you went in the Navy, you were a seaman recruit. You're right. When you got out, you were chief. Right. How long did it take you to make chief? Uh, I was al almost a slick arm. I just managed to get one high school. I was four years, just a little over four years. And during the war, that was they had a lot of slick arms, you know. But normally, you don't make chief in the Navy, regular Navy anymore. You got 10 or 12 years, and regardless of how smart you are, or whatever, it just takes time, you know. But during the war, things were pushed. So what's a slick arm? No, 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 ice no, mark. no, no four year. No, no ice ice mark. Mark. That's what I thought, but yeah. I, you know, yeah. for somebody that. Yeah, every time, every four years, you get a hash mark. Hash mark. What do you call right. a hash mark? Uh, so your service dates uh, I have here December 30th, 1940 to December the 9th of 46. That's the regular Navy. And then back again, uh, your Navy Reserve, uh, December 9 of 46 to December 2nd of 51. Right. And uh, you have Chief Petty Officer 2. What is Chief Petty Officer 2? Well, I have two different ranks. Okay. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Air control. Now, a A C M M. That's ACMM, that's air control. Aviation Chief Machinist Mate. And ACC. Air Controlman Chief. Yeah, okay. They kind of changed the production a little bit. Now, uh, you let me uh, skim through your your book here. It's San Francisco, Oakland. Bay Tracon, T R A C O N. Tell us, tell us about information in that book. Well, What's I decided, yeah, I decided to uh, publish a little memoir of this particular facility. It was the first in the world, in the world, and it, what it involved was <clears throat> a little, give you a little story of how it started. I, uh, when I was in the Washington office, I'd done a lot of travel. In fact, I traveled two weeks every month for two years. One of my assignments, uh, after I, I visited all the big facilities, all the cities in the, in the United States, and all the traffic control facilities, but uh, about uh, six months after I was there, I was called up to the director of air traffic control, and he said, that's when they put the jets into the system. The civil jets. Up until that time, there was no jets. Uh, but uh, radar was still rather new, even in, in aviation. A lot of control towers had it, uh, had radar, but none of the in route centers that controls the traffic between between terminals. Now they're called air route traffic control centers. They control all the high altitude stuff. So when we commissioned, or I'm sorry, when they introduced uh, civil jets to the system, they're flying it now at altitudes of 29,000 feet and above. There was no radar to, except for the military, it had what they call GCI units for uh, ground control intercept for the fighters. The, the, the CAA at that time, FAA, did not have in route long range radar. So they they developed a jet system based on ground navigation. They developed this jet system, but it was strictly non-radar. There was no radar covering that area. 
So they established the routes between the East West Coast principally, and we we detailed con uh, FAA controllers out to the GCI sites just to provide traffic info. They didn't they didn't provide any traffic control radar, but they just provided traffic information to the to the pilots to the civil jets. So we went into the jet era with no radar at high altitudes, except for what we, I just mentioned, that we provide a kind of an advisory service. We call it bird watching, that's what it amounted to. Anyway, uh, and this was developed between the Department of Defense and, the, and the F, now the FAA. I was called in and, and I talked with the director and he said, I'm going to assign you a job. I'd like for you to evaluate the high altitude jet, jet system. And of course the jet system itself was based on ground navigation, but it had never really been tested from the standpoint of uh, civilians, or for that matter, the military. Anyway, I said, fine. So anyway, I was assigned the project and it was on about, about six months. But my first flight, and I was of course an inspector, I flew the jump seat. And of course, at that time, there was only American and, and uh, TWA were the only airlines that had jets when I first started, TWA and, and American. So uh, I started out as a, an inspector flying the jump seat. Of course, you know, captain, airline captains don't like people with a tape recorder sitting behind them. <laughs> anyway, I uh, made my first flight from uh, uh, called Idlewild, it's Kennedy Airport, but it's called Idlewild. Okay. I made my first flight uh, from Idlewild to San Francisco. Now, I'd never been, I'd been in San Francisco ground, I'd never flown into ground in San Francisco, and flew into San Francisco, and uh, was planning on coming back the next day, but I was evaluating what was going on in the, in the, in the civil jet structure, uh, communications and whatever. Anyway, we landed and it was kind of a normal thing. Well, now let me interrupt you here a minute before yeah. you land. As you're flying from Idlewild out to California, uh, are you able to hear the communications between your plane and other planes in the I sky? heard everything. Okay. The pilots talking back and forth, the pilots to their communication station, the pilots to the centers, uh, so I had everything. You know, okay. And, and tape recording everything. Um, anyway, when we landed, I went into to, uh, the Air, uh, it was American Airlines, went into their operations office to check in to, to take the next day back to New York in the same capacity, flying the, and the, uh, the operations uh, guy there said, uh, well, I said, we don't have, can't go back tomorrow because one of our, cat, they, you know, there was only one flight a day. And he says, our, one of our captains has to deadhead back to pick up a flight to come back. So he has a jump seat for tomorrow. So there's no, so you have to wait two days. Well, I, I had a really tight schedule. I said, well, I can't, I can't really wait two days. He said, well, how about take the flight you just came in on and go back today? I said, okay. <laughs> so, I mean, he said about three hours will be going back, so I grabbed a quick bite and went into the operations office, met the crew, and uh, like I said, captains aren't too pleased with FAA guys with tape recorders running around behind them. But anyway, after I explained my... But you explained to him doing, why you were doing what you were doing. And he, he accepted the fact, in fact, they welcomed it, because he didn't know much about the what was going on on the ground. So I took off and, and flew back. But uh, everything seemed to be pretty much normal, except I had a lot of interference uh, between ground and air. The uh, flight, even though there weren't only that many aircraft, this is early, early when jets were first put in the system. And, but there was still some interference being created, and we corrected that right away. That's one thing that we done, uh, cleared up the changing frequencies and so forth. But I'd done that for, uh, about, about six months. I, I got up pretty close to 150, 160 hours in the jump seat with various airlines, different routes, uh, Boston, uh, Philadelphia. I started flying as they expanded 
this structure, I, I kind of expanded with them and went different places. So I'd done that, uh, done that flying for about five or six months. And uh, so uh, anyway, that's, that was the start of, of high altitude uh, root structure, jet structure driving. But uh, about six months after I made this flight, uh, you know, the Western region but was headquartered in Los Angeles. They were going to run a form, what they call a formal evaluation of the San Francisco Tower itself. That's what I was involved in, inspecting towers and so forth. And they invited me to come out and, and be involved with the, the inspection of the San Francisco. I, I looked forward to that because uh, I wanted to really see what was going on inside. I saw what was happening outside, but I wanted to see what was, how the traffic was being handled in the San Francisco area. And of course, having a lot of radar experience and traffic control experience, I was really anxious to see what was going on. And so I, I came, or went back to, uh, to San Francisco and, and participated with a regional crew or evaluation crew. And since I was from Washington, they didn't, and it was their report. I was just kind of, a, you might say, an onlooker and uh, there for consultation, whatever. And uh, but I spent all my time either in the cab or in the radar room watching the operation. And like I say, I was totally amazed. We, not only did they have one radar facility in, in the Bay Area, they had three. San Francisco, Oakland had its own, and we had a naval control at Moffat. We had three radar facilities in a, within a 25 mile radius trying to handle all this traffic. And as I explained in my book, it was, as far as I was concerned, it was, everything was confusion. It was just a jumble, wasn't it? It was a jumble, but despite that, they were doing a good job, but it was this coordination. They, I said it was, it was organized confusion, as far as I was concerned. And I told the, the regional crew my, my feelings on it, and uh, I said, which was really radical. I said, do they ever consider just having one radar facility in this Bay Area to coordinate all this traffic? And that was really radical. They didn't want to hardly touch it, but when you talk more and more, they agreed to put one little paragraph in their big report about possibility of maybe having one radar facility control that whole Bay Area. Well, that was 1950. Nine. In the meantime, uh, I was promoted and transferred. I was chief of the evaluation staff in the Asia Pacific region, and uh, nothing more was heard about having one radar facility. Except I, uh, in 1960, early 65, the Fifth Air Force. In Japan wanted the FAA to make a study of the Japanese Kanto Plains, it's called the Kanto Plains, the Tokyo area, because they were having a lot of problems. And the same problems that really San Francisco was having. They had a, a busy, Haneda was now a metropolitan airport, an international airport, and we had five airports all within about 15 miles of each other. They were having all kinds of problems. Over in Japan. With, yeah, with military. With <clears throat> military and, and uh, so they asked us to come out and take a look at it. So I was, uh, spent three months in Japan. We made a, a study of the Kanto Plains and uh, got to brief the general staff and made a lot of good recommendations. It was terrible what they were doing, a lot of the things they were doing. And they had a lot of radar but wasn't being used properly. But Anyway, it reinforced my thinking about having one facility, radar facility, where these airports are close together to handle the, the traffic. So anyway, uh, more if I went over there, I, I heard that the San Francisco was uh, going to, uh, or the Western region, I should say, was thinking about having one radar facility in the Bay Area. This is six years later. And, and the Washington office was involved with the, the New York office about having a, what they call a common IFR room to handle Newark, LaGuardia, and Idlewild, they call it, or 
uh, Kennedy because they're all very close together, same basic problems at three different facilities. So I heard that perhaps the San Francisco job was going to be available and perhaps they might go to one radar. So I, I bid on the job and, and my division chief said, you don't want to go that way. You're not back in the field. He said, you're in, you know, you're in the administrative area now. You don't want to go back to that. So, but I, I wanted to because I, I was so in, enthused, involved about this particular area. So well, you, 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 I, you, you saw a problem and you wanted to be in on the fixing. Absolutely. So I, I've been on the job, went back to San Francisco, but that was a San Francisco job, and they had not published the, the whole Bay Area job. And about a year later, after I'd started working towards one facility, I was selected to run the whole area. And that's how I got involved in the Bay TRACON. The, the TRACON is Terminal Radar Approach Control, and we, we had one facility, but it was at Oakland, the Oakland Airport, we developed a facility to handle all 12, 12 airports, basically. And uh, the proposition was a lot of people shaking, still shaking their head. That's not the way to go. Well, uh, on a facility like that, how many air traffic controller personnel would be, would be controlling the, all these flights? Well, I started with a, a rather small staff. We started with the, uh, say the, uh, th two airports, uh, three airports, I should say, Oakland, San Francisco, and the Naval Air Station Alameda, all right close together. Yeah. And then uh, about six months later, we took in the South Bay, which was Moffat, so San Jose. They were, they were very busy down there. So anyway, when we put it all together, we had, uh, 12 airports, 10 airports with control towers, <coughs> and we had two radar systems, uh, the one at Oakland and the one at Moffat. The one at San Francisco, we shut out, we didn't need that, because we could control that. So, um, we, we developed procedures to take care, in other words, the, part of that, the Oakland Center, which was feeding this Bay Area, these three airports, all three different airports were now just feeding one. And we could control and select procedures to take care of the whole Bay Area. But are there, were there still air traffic controllers at these three well, airports? Oh, well, and the control towers. They manned the control towers, but they did not control any of the traffic until we put them on final okay. after takeoff. So basically it was one radar facility controlling all the airports and setting up procedures that didn't interfere with each other. Okay. And uh, we were, in the meantime, back east, uh, Washington office was really involved in what they call their common IFR rule. And, uh, common IFR? Yeah, instrument flight rule, common okay. IFR. Uh, but Washington office was involved with it, but we beat them by about three weeks. We went, we commissioned ours uh, three weeks ahead of them, but it had been eight years from the time we made that little radical proposal, put them all in one. Yeah. <laughs> so it finally doubled. We went, we, Government work. <laughs> and, and it worked. We went into uh, a procedure that uh, really worked and we smoothed out the, the flow of traffic. Everything was greatly improved. Mark, Mark, well, improved. Well, let's say on a particular shift at the Oakland uh -huh. control, right. radar control, uh -huh. how many people oh. would be watching these screens? These well, we had three basic, what we call flat top, uh, they were flat, you know, usually the radar sets like a TV system, front like this. We had flat. Uh, and the guys sat opposite each other so they could coordinate quickly and point out and work, could work in the same aerospace. And uh, we had three scopes with two guys at each scope. So we had six actual controllers. And then, of course, you had so called coordinators and guys feeding them flight data positions. So basically, we had eight guys, eight controllers working the position 24 hours a day. So. Uh would these controllers have a break after two hours or four hours, or did they have to just sit there for eight well, hours? Well, yeah, we tried to we tried to break uh, during particularly during the daylight hours, like from 
7 in the morning until 7 or 8 at night, we like to give them a break um, every hour or so, you know, this is a short break. Yeah. But after, during the evening and midwives, we wouldn't, wouldn't not, much about it. But not that much traffic. Not that much. Traffic really slows down. Even yet today, traffic slows down all over the United States, really. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, would you like to see what the traffic looks like in the United States? Let me show you something. Can I show you here? No, I unplugged your computer. Yeah. If you don't mind. Did you, while you're doing that, did you get any awards or recognition for what you did? Oh, yeah, I got a couple of nice letters and I got a nice plaque back here and uh, some good ratings, annual ratings, you get rated, but uh, I'll, if you don't mind this a second here, I'll, I'll... Uh, when you get that on, we'll hold it over here so he can get it on the camera. Well, uh, let, me, let me get it tuned in first. Here. Yeah, yeah. So when I came in here, you were on a, on a walker. How's your health otherwise? Oh, I, I use that to get around the camp. I, I walk quite a bit, but, Good. but I can't walk long distances. Okay. So I use the, because to eat now, I have, you know, it's quite a walk over to the next building Ciao. over. Yeah, so, uh, Good. Were you ever a smoker? Yeah, I, I was a smoker, but a light smoker until until I took over this job, and they had the Asian flu was going around 1967, I caught it, and I was in bed for a couple of days, and I told my wife, I said, if I ever get out of this bed, I'm quit smoking. I quit smoking in 67. Good. <laughs> my father was kind of like that. He smoked cigars and pipes and cigarettes, yeah. and he got sick and was in bed three days and never picked up another tobacco item. Yeah, sometimes it takes something like that to, to get you uh, oh, all this crap is. Well, I'm gonna, that's the bigger, I'm gonna give you the world first. That's all the traffic in the world. From, at this time? At this minute? At this minute. Yeah, <laughs> can you turn it around? I don't know if you can see that, Jim. Oh, yeah. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's around the world. That's all around the world. That's all the traffic that's that's not a, a lot of little airplanes. These are all the major air carriers, military, and everything. Okay. And then we can... Uh, so you still like to play with this? Oh, yeah. I, I said you run traffic all the time. <laughs> I keep check on San Francisco particularly. Now I go to the Bay the Bay Area. I, well, I'm missing the Great Circle Route. These are all aircraft on the Great Circle Route between the U.S. and, and the Orient. Uh, but we're going to go to the San Francisco area here. Now you're looking, you're looking at the San Francisco area there. That's uh, 25 or 30 mile radius of San Francisco. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. So now that's all now being handled. I'll go ahead and go further, but anyway, uh, this is the Bay Area. What, and you can see. What, what if I asked you what the most significant thing you remember about being in air traffic control? What would you say? Uh, this, this this area. The this tracon. This period. This this period that I wrote the memoir on is basically is the tracon. The seven years between '67 and I left there in '74. That seven years is probably the most significant part of my traffic control yeah. experience. Yeah. You know? Not only administratively, but involved with planning roots and that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. But you can see here, see these airplanes? Uh, you see them from the East Coast. They're, they're lined up. They start they start getting them separated. That's just one route to coming in. They, they start separating those uh, 
How far out is that that they start separating? Well, a couple well, hundred miles or longer? Yeah, about a hundred miles. They start making sure. Well, see, that's just one route because they got they got this route from Los Angeles and the route coming from basically from uh, the northwest part of the country, and then all the the Pacific Oceanic routes. A lot of a lot of that traffic, as you can see, uh, between not only San Francisco and uh, but here's the. What? Here, when, when do they start separating them as far as altitude is concerned? Well, altitude separation has been in use all the time. All uh, the way, all the way, whenever you're in the sky, there is right. altitude separation. Yes, there's, uh, depending on types of aircraft and so forth, basically a thousand feet between aircraft, basically. Okay. Uh, when we first started the jet system, it was 2,000 between jets, but a thousand feet between conventional aircraft. Then they also have time separation and lateral separation. Three types of separation: time, lateral, and. In, in the modern day jets, is there any onboard system that can tell them if they're getting too close to another craft? They recently have started what they call a collision avoidance radar that they have, and they consequently have reduced a little bit of the separation that we used to employ with the jets, a high altitude structure. That's right, yes. But they do have collision avoidance radar and separation standards for it, yes. So a collision avoidance radar, is that on board the, each aircraft? Each aircraft, yes. Good. Right. Good. So you can see, here's uh, there's the Hawaiian Islands, but they're not, not too busy right now, but usually there's this, this is the stream between the west coast and Hawaii is just full of yeah. airplanes. No. Some of those are blue aircraft and some are you yellow know, or orange. You know, the blue? I wish you hadn't asked that question because I don't really know okay. what the blue means. <laughs> okay. In fact, I'm going to call, I'm going to get a hold of Radar 24 and say, what does the blue mean? Because I really don't know. <laughs> well, look, I think we've kind of exhausted you and exhausted your topic. Uh, well, whatever. Is, is there anything I haven't asked you about your your life or your family or your career that you, you think somebody might be interested in? Well, no, except I, I've been very uh, blessed, really, with my career. Yeah. I had an interesting career, a long career, and a great family. And, I hope uh, I remember to send you a under your birthday, birthday cards. And I've been a Masonic uh, member for 77 years, so I've been involved in masonry for a long, long time. Well, thank you for your interview, and thank you for your service. All right, sir, thank, thank okay. you. All right, yeah.